Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Wake Live. I am Kayla Kinnear. I'm here with Dan Selke. We apologize for being a few minutes late. Sorry. We are using a new and improved technology, and with that means some new and improved kinks. But Adjustments, but we're we going to come to you just, just more advanced than ever. Yes. Cut to our faces, <laughs> high definition. We've, we've earned it. And thank you for uh, coming to watch us. But a Wick Live, all things Game of Thrones, all things Song of Ice and Fire. Coming at you hard and fast every Wednesday at 4 with all the news and analysis you need to know. And we're going to start things off today. We have some big news about Season 8, Game of Thrones Season 8 today, before we get to our continued walkthrough through a Game of Thrones Song of Ice and Fire series. But let's start off with what's happening in the world <laughs> of Game of Thrones Season 8. Let's do it, Dan. Okay. Um, the big news this uh, week, we'll get to it in a second, but first some... Uh, basic stuff. Peter Dinklage plays um, Tyrion Lannister, and of course is uh, uh, has a lot of buzz for his performance in Three Billboards Outside of Missouri. Great movie. It'd be cool if he won something for that, don't you think? Yeah. I, well, I mean, I think their movie could definitely win Best Picture. There's no chance of him being nominated for like Best Supporting Actor or anything. I don't I mean, think he's he, not nominated. It was movie. no, yeah. He could be the first Game of Thrones uh, actor to get an Emmy Woody and an Oscar. And Sam Rockwell. I think no. so. Yeah, Sam Rockwell. <laughs> But no, yes. he basically he uh, dropped some knowledge. He said that um, they're about halfway done filming the season, which is, uh, you know, so we're moving along there. It actually contrasts with what the HBO programming president said. What did he say? Uh, that it's going to be through August. So, but would, they're, they're on the ground now. That would put the head of schedule. But they're on the ground. We'll know more when that happens. And then Maisie Williams, what are you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say, I'd imagine that the episodes towards the end are going to take longer to film, hopefully, that they're bigger and better. And I mean, they're building this huge King's Landing set. They haven't even filmed anything on it, as far as I know yet, just because the production is so huge and elaborate. I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with that. I'm betting light it on fire or something. <laughs> Curious, do they tear down their sets every time they finish a season? Like, wouldn't it make more sense to just keep those up? Um, it's dependent. Some sets they do tear down. Like the ones they know they're not going to need. I mean, a lot of them they repurpose. Like mm -hmm. um, the same room has been. Remember when Daenerys was in Marine and she had that like throne when she was in the Slavers Bay area yes. in the other continent. That room became a room on Dragonstone where she is now. It's been other stuff. They do that a lot. For their bigger sets, they have left some up. They left the River Run set up. Um, but for these, they're just they're building some new ones. This giant King's Landing set is new. They've had a Winterfell set for years. Mm -hmm. They're just um, refurbishing it each time to, you know, um, add new buttresses and such to it. <laughs> but the big news that we're going to talk about today is there have been some spoilers, some actual honest-to-goodness, you might want to plug your ears if you don't want to hear anything, spoilers. What do you mean already? It's been a while. We've been starved for this kind of stuff, frankly. Couldn't but have for, like, enough. actual footage? Oh, no. We don't, we don't have, like, footage. We're not going to show you that. We're going to tell you information about uh, what's coming. Okay, this involves what the first scene of Game of Thrones Season 8 will be. By the way, I'm poking at this because I can't get the video up to see your comments, but um, please do make them, and hopefully <laughs> I'll get to it so I can answer some of them. You know, oh, good lord. Anyway, uh, the first scene, this comes from a uh, fan site watched on the wall, which is very reliable in the past. Um, they have it. The first scene is going to take place in the winter town outside Winterfell. Any of that means? Winter town outside Winterfell. So Winterfell is a castle. You know where the Starks yes. are. The winter town is a like a, a town that's situated outside the castle. We've seen it a few times. Remember when Brienne was waiting around for Sansa to leave her a candle in the tower? Yes. She was there. She was hanging out there. Okay. I think Tyrion slept with a couple of prostitutes on his uh, first, very first episode in the Winter Town. It's you know, it's like you know, you have um, it's like a university town. If <laughs> if Winterfell is a University of Illinois, and then there's a town that grows up around it to service its people, and like peasants live there. And is that such. where Hot Pie works? No. What's that? Oh no, I got it. Okay, thank you, Richard. The technology is. Um, <laughs> Uh, a, Not been our friend today. No, it's great. It's just, um, it's, it, it marches onward and we have to keep up with it. Anyway, the winter town is kind of a seasonal population. Um, small folk, which are the peasants of the world, they come in, they live there during the winter when it's harsh, and they go back to their villages, but it's always there. 
And we've never really had a, a substantial scene there, but it's going to be the first scene of season eight there, which is intriguing. I'm not sure what to really make of that. I was going to ask you, what does that mean to you? Maybe it's Jamie um, riding up and uh, arriving at Winterfell. That could be it. Thank you, Richard. Hmm. You are the best. What do you guys think I of it? Because involved. Where is the hound right now? The hound is marching up, um, I assume, on the boat with the rest of them. Richard says, Cindy, thank you. I feel so much better, everybody. Now we're back. Okay. Hi, Joanne. Hi, everybody else who has uh, said anything. Lisa, Jesse, <laughs> Michelle, Cindy, Julie. Hey, everybody. So, yeah. What do you guys think of that? What does that mean to you? In the winter town of Winterfell, the first thing of season eight, what could that mean? I don't really know, because we don't really visit a lot. But we'll have to see that when it happens. Who knows? We also have some information on other scenes that are going to happen in the early episodes. And again, this is spoiler stuff. So just keep a low profile. Maybe don't tell this to anybody. <laughs> OK. So we have it that early in the year, there's going to be at least two scenes set in the Winterfell crypts. You know that, right? Yes. That's where Ned Stark's statue is. We had Arya and Sansa. There they are right there. Me meeting. I mean, there's been a lot of important things that have happened there. That's where um, Ned and Robert first kind of met up in the first episode. They went over their shared history. Didn't Littlefinger have a... Yeah, John strangled them against a wall in the, uh, in the Winterfell crypts. It's a nice symbolic area. Who doesn't like a graveyard in a movie or a TV show, right? Right. Dramatic I mean, effect. I love them because they're just so full of... They can't help but be full of history yes. and full of interesting things. And great places to set discussions about the past. Hmm. I mean, they, they, they just are. Um, and one of the scenes, they will be talking about Ned's death, of course. Which, by the way, isn't it impressive how that guy died in the first season and yet he's still has such a big presence on the show? I, for one, love it because I was a huge Ned fan and devastated when he died. Absolutely. I mean, we all are. We all, we all always will be. But I, I like how um, his shadow was kind of laid over the whole thing. Yes. Even up to this point. And then another scene. We, we don't know, uh, Sarah asked, or John and Arya going to meet there? That could be pretty cool. Ooh, I would like that. They can like do a thing where they're at one end of each of the tunnels and then they see each other and they run and they hug. That would be sweet. Um, but we're, we're, we don't know who will be in there. We know it'll be two leading cast members. It's very possible. Might be a little repetitive, honestly, as the way they, uh, Arya and Sansa met. And then another of the scenes will end with a horn being blown. Now, Kayla, do you know the significance of horns as it relates to the Night's Watch or the North in general? Um, White Walkers are coming? <laughs> Quite possibly. <laughs> Horns, at least in the Night's Watch, are uh, signifiers of who's coming. One blast for allies, two blasts for wildlings, three blasts for White Walkers. Ooh. Although this is Winterfell, not Were Night's Watch. Were they specific as to how many blasts will be made? They did not. Uh. They're keeping it under wraps, which they should, of course. <laughs> So I think that's some pretty good spoilers to chew on. Um, any thoughts on that, Kayla? Didn't Arya have something to say about season eight? She did. Yeah, we can go back to that real quick. I was skipping through it because we started a little late, oh, so I was like, eh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Didn't yeah. know you did it on purpose. Macy Williams has been on a big um, press tour recently for her new movie, Early Man. Ooh, really quick, let's pause for comments. Chris? Enemy approaches, very possible. <laughs> I'm with Chris. Hi, Shulor Hayes from Fort Worth, Texas. Love Wick, we do too. Ooh, it could be Bran tells John he's a Targaryen. That could be a fun scene <gasps> set in the crypts. That would be cool, I would like that. Because you gotta do it underground, because you can't let that crazy dragon lady know about it. Right. I would like that a lot. All the secret meetings happen down there. They do. Or the Horn of Winter suggests Nina, which is a uh, horn from the books has kind of been cut from the show, but anything is possible. But yeah, Maisie Williams has been on the press tour for her new movie, Early Man. Are you a fan of any of those claymation movies from uh, Nick Park, Wallace and Gromit, Chicken Run? I don't think so. Fair enough. That's fine. Chicken Run. Did you watch it? I don't know. I haven't. I don't but think I, I, have. I do know that they're, they're a thing. Okay. She's in a new one. She's in the newest one, Early Man. And she's out doing a lot of press for it. And of course, whenever a Game of Thrones cast member does press, all the journalists are trying to pick at them and try to get them to tear and tell them stuff That's about That's got to get old after a while. I mean, they're all really good at it by this point. Yeah. But yeah, it does get old after a while, I'm sure. But it's okay because they do end up cracking and giving away things. 
or at least teasing stuff. Ms. Williams had an interesting thing to say about um, what's going to She was just asked, will season eight satisfy people? Why don't you read what she had to say, Kayla? Be Maisie Williams. I'll be Maisie. Oh, she's also going to be uh, a bridesmaid. She is going to be a bridesmaid. Sophie, Sophie Turner's Turner. wedding. How cute is that? To Joe Jonas. To Joe Jonas. The Jonas brother. Um, she said, it's either going to be everything that everyone dreamed of, <laughs> or it's going to be disappointing. It depends which side of the fence you're going to sit on. I think no matter what you do, there's definitely going to be that divide. It depends on what people want from the final season. I love it, but I don't know. And you never know. Every actor has said the same thing about this. They either say, it's great, or you're not going to love it. Is it <laughs> like, is that's it, not helpful. It, it, I mean, is it disturbing that they're not just having a panegyric about it and just lauding it up and down? Does the fact that they're being a little, like, hedging their bets tell you that there could be something that something we don't like big coming? It's definitely going to happen, based on what they're saying. I mean, the tricky thing is, though, different people want different things. Like, I, mean, I guess what That's she said. That's why they're saying, like, we're not going to be able to please everybody here because not everyone's going to like the outcome that we're going with, but... I don't know. I think if you're inspired and enthused enough, you would just praise it to high heaven. I feel like there's only... Right, yeah. Which I've, I think Sophie Turner did that, yes? Some have been more uh, clear, but there have been enough that Others have been Others have been like, you're either going to love it or hate it. Jason Momoa did that, but I mean, you can't trust him. He's a big ball of loud testosterone. Does he know how it ends? He did. He was hanging out with him and they all told him everything. <gasps> I feel like that's someone that wouldn't be able to keep a secret well. No. It's funny they'll talk about him, by the way. He did an interview recently where it was, uh, he talked about how after Game of Thrones ended, he couldn't get work because no one thought he spoke English. <laughs> I just saw him on a late night show recently. Jimmy Why Fallon. Yeah. Because he's going to for Aquaman pretty soon. Yep. Which would be, will you go see Aquaman, Kayla? Mm, maybe. <laughs> you can say no. <laughs> I know you're not into superhero stuff. It's an acquired taste. Sometimes that, I am. That, just... that, that, that's funny though. Like, what do they think he spoke? Because, it, like, it's not Dothraki. Dothraki. <laughs> it's not a real language. <laughs> that's hilarious, actually. It was pretty funny. About it. Anyway, uh, what do you guys think? Are you. Does that put you at ease that Maisie Williams is kind of uh, hedging your bets? Or are you encouraged? Are you encouraged or discouraged by this lukewarm teasing kind of middle path. I feel like tease. there's only one way they could go that would make somewhat of a happy ending. I mean, what would it be? Basically it would have to be that Cersei gets killed. Well that's gonna happen. But then beyond that I don't care who's in power. Like Okay, okay. Well, what what if Daenerys got in power but John died? Would that be a happy ending to you? Mm, no. <laughs> what about? Why I so hard about that. No. No, it's fine. You can to, <laughs> what about the opposite? What if John gets in power but Daenerys dies? I think I would be okay with that more. Is that bad to say? But I, I love. It's Daenerys. terrible to say. Yes. Yeah, I like both. <laughs> kidding. No, it's fine. So you're making me choose. You think that either. Well, no, I'm just other. wondering what what does a happy ending even mean in this context? Yes. Yeah, see, I don't even know that. That's why I think they're being so vague because I don't the think other... they know. I mean, I'm sure they know. But the thing about, like, what if they both lived, they both ruled, that would be a happy ending, right? Yes. But that, but that would make other people angry. That happy, would make me angry, frankly. A happy frankly. ending in my book would be all the Starks together and alive. I mean, all their most times are still alive anyway. Um, see, that would make another subset angry, though. That would make me angry, because I don't think you should get to the end without having a few more deaths, without having some more sacrifice. So I guess she's Tyrion right. Tyrion must live. Okay, for a happy ending. That's one of your qualifiers. <laughs> we should do a breakdown of what we would We should make, do a show on this. What, what does make, a happy ending mean? Right, what would we be Coming next week. What does that even mean, Game of Thrones? <laughs> That's next week. <laughs> Chris is worthy anyway to disappoint with the actors talking like that. And yeah, I mean, I, I get a little bit of that. I'm I hoping they'll pull it through. all good but... shows have to have something that's going to just make you mad. I mean, that's this has already had show. plenty of it. Jamie kills Cersei, according to Nina. Could totally happen. And yes, I think Kenny just says, someone we love will die. I hope that happens, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> I think it's a good time. Next week, we'll just do, what, what would a happy ending mean? What a preview. <laughs> right, before we uh, sign off with Kayla. And you can tell us what a happy ending would mean for you. I love that. Um, Super Bowl is coming up pretty, pretty quick. 
another sign of the uh, prominence of this cast. Yes. Have you have you seen this? No. Okay, so I read about uh, it, but I well, we haven't seen it yet, right? Um, the the, the commercial, no. Okay. <laughs> Super Bowl's coming up, and Peter Dinklage is going to be in a Pepsi commercial with Love it. Morgan Love it. Freeman. Amazing. We have a little uh, bit here, uh, an image, where Peter Dinklage is representing Doritos Blaze, and Morgan Freeman's representing Mountain Dew Ice. Have you always wanted to see those two face off, Kayla? I have. Yeah, me too. And now you can. Who doesn't love Morgan Freeman? What a weird pairing. That is strange, yes. I, I just like that this cast has been popular enough now to appear in a Super Bowl commercial mm -hmm. and to face off against an icon like Morgan Freeman. Good for Peter Dinklage, good for America. That's why Tyrion's not going to die. <laughs> Go on. Kidding, that's Dan. Fine. All right, Kayla, any other thoughts before we sign off? I think that's it for me today. All right, I think next we are going to dive further into A Game of Thrones with our continued reread through the series. Kayla, lovely seeing you. Lovely seeing you as always, Dan. Okay. And this series is called A Song of Dan and Josh. Um, I've read all the books multiple times. Josh Hill has seen the show but not read the books. And we go through chapter by chapter looking for insights. Josh, how are you? I am good. How are you, Dan? I'm swell. I'm a solid 8 out of 10. <laughs> All right, so today we read two chapters. We did. We got Bran at number four, and uh, whatever chapter we're on with Ned now, uh, number five. All right, the, for, the, uh, the fourth Bran chapter, how did it strike you? It was, you made the note that it was another moody Stark child, and I really got that, but I couldn't kill him, because it was, you know, one of the things he's upset about is, uh, my legs don't work. And I was oh, yeah. Like, uh, Here's you your know. question. Do, do you um, read the notes I send you after or before you read the chapters after okay just noting yeah i usually read the book there are the chapters that we're reading over the weekend let it marinate yeah, a couple of days because you usually send your notes ahead of time because as you're coming people know <laughs> dan is on top of stuff um yeah he's all moody about his legs not working and it's just like <laughs> how dare he it's like come on of, all, of the list of things that we've seen like aria and sansa and even john to get upset about it's like I feel like Bran is a little justified in my legs are never going to work. Oh, sure. I mean, I think they were all, maybe not John, a little justified. Just what I noticed, and I hadn't noticed this before, that this chapter, that this is about Bran just kind of being at Winterfell. You know, his legs don't work. He's upset. Tyrion comes by and makes him that uh, specialty saddle. Yeah. Talk about that in a second. But, I mean, I hadn't noticed, and I'm, I'm not sure if you did on the first read-through before, that it's very similar to the chapters we got with John and Arya. It followed, like, the exact same emotional arc. Hmm where John is at the wall and he's upset because he's too good for this and yeah. he was built in the castle, all these people are scrubs and he's better than them. And then by the end he kind of comes around to it and he's like, okay, I can deal with this. And then we have the Arya chapter where she's in King's Landing and she's upset mm -hmm. because her friend Micah is dead and her sister Sansa's being mean and she's all down to the dumps. And then she comes around to it because yeah. she gets a cool sword fighting teacher and she's okay. And now we have this chapter which is really very, very similar, where Bran's upset because he can't walk, mm. which, you know, it's a very good reason to be upset. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it is. I'm not yeah. taking that away from him. Um, and then, slowly, he comes around to it because at the end, he has that sweet scene with uh, Rob, and they hold hands, and mm. they kind of uh, forge ahead together. Yeah. Do you think that's purposeful, lazy, coincidental, or just do you have any thoughts on that at all? Uh, I didn't think it was lazy. Maybe coincidental a little mm -hmm. bit because we do have in these back-to-back -back chapters world building through characters basically rambling on about things. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, I, I was amused by that in that it's, it's, it's almost a game at this point to figure out how George R. R. Martin is going to build out the world subtly without just being like, here's a bunch of ex exposition. It's always like mm -hmm. this character, like old Nan or, or, or Picel in the next chapter where it's like, oh yes, here's a rambling about this thing that's you know, relevant to the conversation, but also builds out this world. So I kind of felt that the arcs of these chapters were, you can clearly see he's in some kind of mindset, George R. Oh, sure. Martin is. So I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't take away anything negative from that as a lazy thing. I just thought, that's his style. That's, that's what he likes yeah. to do. He's, he's setting things up. Yeah. By the way, uh, Michael Allardyce says, my favorite Game of Thrones show, Josh inspired me to read the books. There you Look go. 
Good for All you, right. Josh. We're, we're inspiring kids to read. <laughs> inspiring kids to there read. You, go. <laughs> you do it, little Michael. You, you, you there live you your dreams. You got it, bud. Um, they also are their siblings, too. So I figured, you know, oh, the, the, the structure of the chapters are probably the same because they're related. So then that's also why I guess I, I didn't think of it as, oh, George R. R. Martin's fallen back on an easy it's thing. Old, to like, these tropes. Things. Yeah, it's like. Maybe I'm reading too much into that, but I mean, I, I, figured I didn't similar, either. So. I didn't even notice until I was like doing this close read through that they were really similar like this. Mm -hmm. It just it jumped out at me this time. Also, it's like it's just character development. That's just what happens. Yeah, characters have to go from one place to the next, and they're all changing. So it makes sense to be a little sad about it. Um, let's. You mentioned old Nan and Pycelle and just kind of the, <laughs> the setup, yeah. all this world building stuff. Old Nan old is Nan. an interesting character, I think, because. Even after she's left the story, mm -hmm. and even after um, you know Winter Focus taken over by the Greyjoys, and I think I think she dies. We don't really get confirmation. They refer back to her a lot and talk mm -hmm. about like she told me this story about yada yada yada. Like whenever he wants to get some kind of myth out there, old man. She's she's he loves to use her to talk about the show's mythology, mm -hmm. and she gives a really important monologue, a really a, a kind of famous monologue. I mean, famous insofar as anything in Game of Thrones is famous, um, here about the White Walkers. And I was, I was thinking, because um, it's so important, that I could read a part of it now. Would you mind? Story time with Dan. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, my sweet summer child, what do you know of fear? Fear is for the winter, my little lord, when the snows fall a hundred feet deep and the ice wind comes howling out of the north. Fear is for the long night, when the sun hides its face for years at a time. Little children are born and live and die, all in darkness, while the dire wolves grow gaunt and hungry, and the white walkers move through the woods. One more. Okay. In that darkness, the others came for the first time. They were cold things, dead things, that hated iron and fire and the touch of the sun, and every creature with hot blood in its veins. They swept over holdfasts and cities and kingdoms, felled heroes and armies by the score, riding their pale dead horses, leading hosts of the slain. All the swords of men could not stay their advance, and even maidens and suckling babes found no pity in them. They hunted the maids through frozen forests and fed the dead servants on the flesh of human children. It goes on for like another two pages, but yeah. the point is, that's, thank you. I, I didn't want to do a voice. I don't know how that would turn out. Well, I mean, it's an audition for the audio book. There you go. That's, that's what you do after the show ends. Dan yeah, the audiobooks. they can re-record them with me. There. I can do voices. <laughs> That'll be the exact same voice. I did when I was when I was reading that. You know, kind of in my head, pictured you know, in like the Disney movies when they're they're explaining yeah. something dark and it's like yeah, all of a sudden that. the frame gets dark and the trees lose all their leaves and stuff. It kind of had that impression to it. Where it was like this is a very important dark thing that is being described here. It has a mood. Yeah. Like, it definitely has a mood. And you're already, we've already seen the White Walkers, too, or in the first, the prologue. Yeah, we did. So it was kind of a nice reminder back to, this is a serious thing. And I did like that, and this is true in the show, too, that we get so caught up in the politics and the mm -hmm. mystery and the character building and the relationships that we kind of forget that, the, that there's this cold cloud, like, sitting out in the distance, mm -hmm. waiting to come in snow and winter is coming and all that. And so that's, this to me was a first reminder of that. And we've seen that a lot in the show, so. And it, it's such an elemental threat. Yeah. That like, opposed to the, like, like Pycelle has a big monologue about yeah. some boring stuff about, about seasons and it's kind of more dry because it's, it's a little more ordinary what they're mm -hmm. doing in politics. But the White Walkers are like, they're elemental. They mm -hmm. are winter. So it, it makes sense to have that Disney-ish. I like that yeah. Disney comparison, like a Disney, Kind of, you're right. Like it goes all dark, and it's just the creepy old lady and the little kid in the bed. And it's just mm -hmm. a spooky time storyville, and it, I, I thought it really works. Yeah. And that monologue has become pretty well known. I think it's like a meme. Like yeah. you know, whenever someone's like, uh, "I think he'll release the Winds of Winter this year," people will be like, "Oh, you sweet summer child," that kind of thing. <laughs> so I didn't know that was a famous monologue. In I mean, again, <laughs> I'm using famous really loosely. Well, it did here, stick but... out when I read it, though. So it, yeah. it, it, it's nice that that's a remembered thing. Now, now I get all the memes, so right. I enjoy it more. It was on the show. The whole thing wasn't on the show, but no. a lot of it was. So they, they put that in. So we got, um, oh, one more bit with old Nan is that, uh, again, I, I, I'll keep hopping aside. I'm always impressed by his long-term uh, foreshadowing. He mentions Hodor comes into it mm -hmm. and just talks about how Hodor is actually old Nan's 
like great grandson or something, maybe great grand nephew, related to old man somehow. Yeah. Was that established on the show? Yes, it was. It was because okay. in the flashback we saw young old Nan right. and young Hodor. That's he was just right. Nan back then, I guess, and uh, just they, they, they talked. And uh, he said that no one knew where Hodor had come from, old Nan said, but when he started saying it, they just started calling him it. It was the only word he had. Now obviously we know that is like super, super long-term setup mm -hmm. for his whole time travel rigmarole stuff. Yeah. But I mean, how would you know it back then? So much stuff going on. It's just fun to see that he just sneaks little things in there that will yeah. just depth charge and then explode years later. And finally, we got uh, Tyrion's uh, comes to Winterfell. Yeah. Shares some information with um, Rob and Bran. Kindly offers him this uh, specialty saddle. Mm -hmm. So Bran, the crippled boy, can ride in a, uh, a saddle with a horse. But he's treated like crap by Rob and uh, other people. What do you make of this scene? Tyrion Rob relationship or just the scene in general? I mean, this is this goes back to I felt like he's got two things working against him. He's both a Lannister and is also an imp. So it's like mm -hmm. you're you're playing from behind doubly if you're if you're Tyrion. So I you know, you made a note in here about not having a chapter from Rob's perspective. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know I went back and forth in thinking I'm okay with that because he's kind of like this background character in these chapters so far, so it's not really, I don't need Rob's perspective. It's not like no. I feel like I'm missing anything. No, you don't need Without it. Rob's perspective. But just have, having seen the show and these interactions that he, that he does have, I feel like maybe we could have had a couple Rob chapters. Why is he so anti-Rob? I don't know. He's, he's, a... he's not anti-Rob. I think the thing is, the, like Rob is an, a, a fairly important character. I mean, he, he becomes the king in the north. Yeah. He has this whole plot around him. In the book, he chose to do it from other perspectives. The, I think he looms larger on the show mm. just because he, the plot does kind of revolve around him. It was never about him, though. Yeah, it's true. I, I think what he said was, I wish I had had a couple point of view chapters in there so he would have been, it would have more surprised when he died. Yeah. Like, I think he was surprised by how people responded to Rob. Mm -hmm. Because he just, he, he never thought of him as a really important character. Mm -hmm. But he kind of he projects importance when you read or especially when you see him mm -hmm. yeah so I don't know I always like when Tyrion pops up in these chapters mm. again this is another like kind of sympathetic thing for Tyrion where the Lannisters are built up as this family that we're mm. not supposed to like and Tyrion consistently seems to be on one hand he is a Lannister mm -hmm. and on the other hand you're like oh, but I, I like him I'm so, I, 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 Absolutely. I, there's empathy there and it's I don't know it's but I mean we talked about last week, um, or maybe the week before that, the notion that, yeah, yeah, he's obviously a nice guy, but I think you said that he's the good Lannister. But good. I think the, the point of this chapter is, even though he is, other people do not know that. Exactly. Like, Rob treats him like crap. Mm -hmm. and, like, and, and, we, and Rob's a good guy, too. But he doesn't see the good guy Lannister. Mm -hmm. He sees the person who's part of the family who probably pushed my brother out a window. Yeah, and also the impish part of it, I mm -hmm. think, makes it easier for people just to be like, oh, I definitely have, I don't want anything to do with this. Because, right. you know, maybe if he was Jamie or somebody, people would be less prejudiced towards him. But we, there is this established prejudice towards Tyrion because he's an imp, and then he's also a Lannister. So I feel like he's got both things working against him. Right, and, and that's his fight, I think. To, yeah. get people, to convince people that he is a decent guy, mm -hmm. even though he's part of this family. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I like that Martin doesn't um, bow to cliche. Mm. I mean, I feel like in some shows or TV shows or movies, like the, people would just respect the good guy anyway. Yeah. Like they wouldn't actually have, have to overcome this prejudice. And I like the bit where the direwolves still hate Tyrion. And um, I think it was <laughs> yeah. both Grey Wind and yeah. Summer, Brandon Ralph are, like, are, are snapping at him. Rick on Cyborg, Shaggy Dog is like, they have to call him back lest he like tear his throat out. Because mm -hmm. I mean, because. You've seen the cliche before, right? Yeah. Where, like, if the dog likes you, you're really a good person inside. Yeah. But even though Tyrion is a good person, the dogs still hate him, mm -hmm. which I like. I think that plays against type a little bit. Yeah. So good for dog stuff. Any <laughs> your thoughts on this? Uh, no, you pretty much said it all. All right. Yeah, so Julie would have liked some Rob chapters. It would have been interesting. Yeah. It's hard to um, imagine what it would have been like. That could have been cool. And what will Tyrion do in the coming season? We're talking about books. I don't know. That was from a hater. Wait, there's a TV show about this? I thought it was just a book. They're, they're oh. making one, is oh. what I hear. All right. There you go. Could be okay. Here it's going to be on a... 
Showtime, and it's going to last Showtime. for 14 seasons. They should seasons. put it on that channel that has Oz. Oz is a really good show. <laughs> HBO, I think. Yeah. We're time traveling. This is fun. <laughs> Was Pause, that on the 1996? Man. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know either. Um, around then. It was like their first kind of prestige show. Yeah, late 90s. Exactly. How far they've come. They haven't really come that far in a lot of ways. Game of Thrones is still about, um, <laughs> you know, having sex, cursing, violence. They're in the prison of their own minds. Exactly. There you go. Isn't the entire society kind of a prison? Oh, yeah. Speaking of that, let's talk about uh, the latest Ned chapter. Yes. Eddard 5. So we got more uh, plot progression, basically. This mm -hmm. is more, I'd say that the Ned chapters don't have that kind of emotional arc that no. the Bran and Arya John stuff do, but they do have what the meat of the plot is. Mm -hmm. He's trying to discover who killed John Aaron. Mm -hmm. What goes down in this chapter? Uh, well, it's, like you said in your note, I like that you put it's Agatha Christie, <laughs> Game <laughs> of Thrones by Agatha Christie. Um, basically, Nez is trying to figure out this mystery that's going on with yeah. John Aaron. Who killed John, killed John Aaron? Killed John Aaron. And he's basically led on a, this whole MacGuffin chase by Littlefinger, which I noted is the brilliance of, of Littlefinger's trickery. Because he's that guy who is the one that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's like The Departed, where Matt Damon has to find out who Matt Damon is. And, you know, that his, his character is trying yes. to find the rat, but he's the rat. So we've got <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's Littlefinger is trying to be like, who's the murderer? And he's the murderer. Yes, so. let's remember this whole thing is who killed John Aaron. Littlefinger killed John Aaron. Exactly. True, Lysa Aaron, but still. And I just, it, reading this back and like, and he's the one helping Ned, mm -hmm. pointing him in the right direction or the wrong direction, I yeah. guess. I loved it. That was, because I, I like Littlefinger on the show. Mm -hmm. So to me, this was. I liked him in the other chapters before. It was kind of building mm -hmm. up his weaselness, his little, you know. He always still be, got the weaselness going on. Yeah, always being three steps ahead of everybody else. Yeah. I like that. And poor Ned. Like, Ned is, you know, we don't have a lot of character development in Ned's chapters because I don't feel like we Good need time. to. It seems like right away from the very first Bran chapter, he is this authoritative figure that doesn't really, you accept yeah. him as this this figure that you really respect. And it, this chapter totally kind of do. bummed me out because he is getting the runaround. And I know he's getting the runaround. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's another show. thing. Like, we know he's getting the runaround. Mm -hmm. Like, as we've seen the show, we know Littlefinger's behind this. We, you, you, don't, you don't know that if you're just reading the book. Yeah. Like, Littlefinger could be lying. He could be helping. You, mm -hmm. you don't know who killed John Aaron. Yeah. That, that, that only, it's only clear in retrospect. What I think is cool is that, I mean, Ned is, you're right, he's, he's a patsy. He's getting jerked yeah. around. He's being, Littlefinger is three steps ahead of him. Yeah. Because, obviously. But you still sympathize with Ned because of that point of view thing, where to him, he's making the right calls and being smart and being direct about it. Mm -hmm. Which is, um, again, it's just the, the kind of narrative tricks, the point of view structure of Forbes are, yeah. are interesting. It's the tragedy of Ned. But again, you don't see it coming. Like, no. the, the, the twist of it is Ned dies, mm -hmm. and everything up to then, you, you, you see it, how it got there step by step, and it, it just comes as a shock because it just doesn't happen in these mm -hmm. sorts of stories. Okay, what else do we got here? Oh, I also want to point out about the whole murder mystery thing mm -hmm. is um, I, I, I like how little it matters in the end. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... You know, the whole reason Ned's here is to find out who killed John Aaron, but at the end of the day, does that have, like, any effect on the White Walkers or Daenerys coming mm -hmm. over or even, like, Stannis or the War of the Five Kings? No. Like, it's a small potato thing, but he uses it to kind of kickstart this chain of dominoes that leaves them much bigger, which mm -hmm. I, I think is, is, is sort of unique. I can't really think of many other stories that do that. Yeah, and, the, you know, that's, what, that's one thing I appreciate about the show, too, mm -hmm. is it is this political character-driven mm -hmm. drama that happens to have dragons in it. But also, it's not even about that, because at the end of the day, it's about what's north of the wall. Mm -hmm. So this, I, I like that this is kind of planting those seeds of getting us invested in the distractions around. This is yes. like the reality yes, television. Yes, very good at that. So we don't watch the news. You know, we're distracting ourselves, taking oh, ourselves that. out of it. So, and I do like that, that was, this is kind of the introduction to that. And I feel like if I hadn't seen the show, I would have been shocked with, that Ned was killed and there was the twist in the chapter. But right. having known what happens, it almost makes it worse because I know yeah. it's going to happen. And now it's even slower, and I'm literally getting inside of these people's heads. And I'm like, oh, it's even more maddening. And I don't know. It, it's more tra it feels more tragic knowing that what's going to happen and literally being in Ned's head as he's trying to work through these things, and I'm over here like, 
no, it's all a MacGuffin. Don't do this. And it's like, <laughs> it, it hurts even more. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm glad you're in pain. Um, <laughs> let's really quick hit uh, Picel and Arya just real fast. Yes. Um, probably our, our biggest exposure to Picel yet. He talks mm -hmm. a bit about the, the weird seasons on Westeros. He doesn't really do much. Mm -hmm. um, he suggests now that Varys is behind this. Um, and he notes about Picel yet. He's, kind of, he's an interesting, like, flat slash deep character. Yeah. It seems like he's... I'm interested in learning more about Picel. <coughs> I, don't, I don't feel that familiar with him on the show. I don't know, maybe it's because I've just... He was I've always kind of in the background, the up to the minute he blew up. Yeah, so I'm interested in getting more into that hierarchy of people that will be in Cersei's cabinet and her little think tank. So, right. Yeah, he is kind of a weird, flat, yet deepish character. I don't know. I mean, on the show, it's interesting because they have a little thing where he acts like a doddering old senile idiot, mm -hmm. but he's basically all an act. He just yeah. wants to not draw attention to himself and just kind of remain in circles of power. Mm -hmm. I don't honestly know if they made it up for the show or if I'm like looking for it in the books now. Mm -hmm. And I haven't really found it yet, so I'll see. Hmm. The last bit to, uh, about the Ned chapter is he has a brief conversation with Arya, yeah. where she's um, trying to balance because she's training with Serial Pharrell. And he has a conversation with her, which is in the show, where she just basically asks, when I grow up, can I do all the cool things that Bran can do? Like, you know, own a household, or be the High Septon, or uh, manage a holdfast, build, build stuff. Things. <laughs> well, Br Bran can do those things. Wow. Like Ned says, oh, Bran, could, Bran, Bran won't be a knight, because, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's just not going to happen. But um, he could, he could uh, become the High Septon, yeah. or he could be an architect, like build a wall, the wall, or hold fast. He could um, manage a household. And then Arya's like, can I do any of that? And he's like, no, you'll be a, um, a mother and run a household for your lord husband. Mm -hmm. And she just says, uh, no, that's Sansa, and goes back to um, what she was doing. And I think this is, a, this is interesting. This is a bit of a touchy subject. Because of... Um, I, I think that some fantasy books, they add in, like, a strong female character type, mm -hmm. and that's kind of all there is to her. Like, um, The Name of the Wind books, I don't know if you've read those at all. They're, 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 they're pretty big. They've got an adaptation by Lin-Manuel Miranda for Showtime. Um, I think they have that problem. I think Lord of the Rings is a, is a fantasy book, yeah. kind of the, where there's just, there's, like, two women, and they just, their jobs just kind of stand there and look interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I like how George R. R. Martin includes these elements of female empowerment, but does it in a way that isn't cloying or preachy or obvious. Yeah. Where this society has gender norms, it has characters like Arya who transgress against those gender norms, but it, it's not done in a way where it's flat or in a way where that's all there is to them. Mm -hmm. Like Arya is a character yeah. who has a full character, a full personality who happens to be also, someone who's not going to play by the rules that are set up. Mm -hmm. Sansa is also a full character, but she does play by those rules. She's happy to. Yeah. So I like that there's that variety in his, in his female characters. I enjoy and that's kind of what I wanted to say. Do you yeah. have any thoughts on it? <laughs> no, I felt, I felt the same way. Kind of like breaking the gender norms is something mm -hmm. that Arya obviously does in the show. And now, I remember this scene from the first season. Yeah, they, they included this bit. Yeah. And it didn't. Re it, it stuck. It stuck out to me then, but th it felt more powerful here, just because mm -hmm. Ned has been built up as this character who you respect and you like, and even he is like, no, yeah, no, 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 you're even going to Ned do this. Yeah. thinks that like, oh, you're a woman. You're definitely. Get, you're, this, this is what women do. Yeah, and Arya is just kind of like, no, I'm not yeah. going to do that. And it, I do like that it wasn't forced. It wasn't on the nose, and she wasn't mm -hmm. like, I'm going to storm out of the room and make my own way. It was kind of like, it's planting a seed in her head that I feel is going to sprout over the course of these chapters and these right. books, where it's going to keep going back to this. It's not a one-and-done thing where it's like, now she's a strong, independent woman. It's like she's growing towards these things that's going to eventually make her a stronger character, a stronger female character. And I think that it was really well written. Yeah, just like a, a nice little moment that definitely fore, foresees bigger things in the future yeah. for her. Any other thoughts on this? These chapters, Jen? Your name is Josh. I did. Sorry, is. John. Or John. Yeah, it's like John, John Snow's on the brain. I said so. a song of Dan and John. A song of Dan <laughs> and Josh. Wednesdays at four. four. And it will be four next time. Yeah. I no, uh, I, I did enjoy these two chapters. So I, did, I, always liked, I always liked the Ned chapters. It seems... 
The brand chapter was, I liked it because it, it, it did build in the, uh, the White Walker thing. We had the old right. man, which now I know is a huge seminal moment in these books. I mean, we keep saying these big words. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to frame it, put it on my wall now. Right. I think next week uh, we should read the next John chapter, mm -hmm. where we meet a certain fat um, maester in training, or future maester in training, and um, the next Ned chapter. All right. All right. We will see you guys back here at 4 o'clock Central next Wednesday. For more WIC Live and more of Song of Ben and Josh, thanks for watching.